This is Talking Business, the weekly business interview from Tees Business in association with Cornerstone Business Solutions, Teesside's commercial IT specialists. This week we're joined by another well-known face from the Tees region's business scene, his boyhood interest in Meccano, inspired a <laughs> career in industry. He rose from ICI apprentice to chairman of SABIC, ambassador and spokesman for the chemical industry, Latterly, the chair of Tees Valley Local Enterprise Partnership, spearheading engagement with business leaders across the north. He tells me he's now retired, but I'll believe it when I see it. I'm delighted to welcome Paul Booth to Talking Business. Welcome, Paul. Hi, good morning, Dave. So, Paul, we're going to talk about your, your career. We, we won't be fit in the full 50 years, but the um, you went from apprentice to chairman. I mean... That's not a bad rise, so uh, not a bad advert for apprenticeships, I would suggest. So I'm, yes. I'm, guessing, I'm guessing you're a big fan of apprenticeships, first of all. Well, I'm a very big fan of apprenticeships. Um, it, it's something I look back on uh, and um, with, with pride and, and uh, with, with great nostalgia. But, but I think more importantly, you know, apprenticeships. Yes, you learn stuff. You, know, you learn to use your hands. You learn. You, know, you learn. You learn things, uh, technical things. But you also learn about being with people and 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 learn and being around people and being in teams and working together and comradeship. Um, it's it's far. It's 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 one word, but it means a lot. Uh, and, and something you know, people ask me, you know, what? Why do I do what I do now? It goes back to those days when. Um, yes, I was an apprentice, but like lots of apprentices in the 70s, um, I was made redundant. Um, that wasn't that, you know, that was just the way it was. It, you know, it was uh, nothing personal, just the way it was. And um, a very a, a great guy, pers personnel in those days, it wasn't HR, um, asked me what I was going to be doing. And I said, I wasn't too sure. So he took me in his office and said, I think you need to go to university, young man. And um, one week later, uh, I was at Manchester Uni at Freshers Week, sponsored by ICI. And the point about that is, well, the, the point about that is, it's about helping people, giving people a leg up, making, you know, so looking after people, caring for people. And and I suppose, you know, I spent as, as best I can, people will, you know, have their own views on how successful I've been, um, trying to put something back. You know, you know, I spent many years, as you know, uh, TTE, and I've, I've worked in you know many academic institutions, and that's all really goes back to somebody giving me a chance to you know to improve and to be better, and and apprentices is a, apprenticeships are a great way to do that. I was going to so say yes, that. I'm a fan of apprenticeships. No one will be. Paul, you've been so you've been you were chair of TTE, I believe. I'm right in saying. So TTE, uh, the, the apprenticeships, um, full, you know, obviously one of the, the leading uh, apprenticeships uh, supplier in this area. And, th yeah. and then you've also, you're on the board of Teesside University. Yes. So, I mean, how, how do you, is, is there a, how, how do you wrestle with that? I mean, is there a best way to go or is it about horses for courses? Or, I mean, you did both, so. Yeah, well, I I don't think there is a best way to go. I think it's 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 whatever ways. Well, sorry, it's whatever ways best for you. You know, there are people who um, I, I I personally benefited from four years shop floor experience. As I said, it wasn't just about you know learning how to you know to to use your hands and and going to night school and things. It was far far more than that. And I think when I went to university, I was probably older and wiser and more mature, and maybe applied myself better than I would have if I'd done, if I'd done you know gone the, the normal route that's not for everybody but equally you know I, I think the idea that there is you know that there's only one way to do something is wrong you know th there's no for me th there was a while I guess in the 80s and 90s when you know people were saying you shouldn't be an apprentice you need to go to university and, and, and better yourself well actually an apprenticeship route is an equally valid route to university as any other route because I've heard people say, Paul, I've heard people say over the years, well, you're too bright, too too bright to be an apprentice. Well, well, and that's, <laughs> I think, I think that's, it's just, it's wrong. It's, it's, you know what? Somebody once said to me, you know, what's your ambition? 
And I'm, I was having to think, and he said, let me tell you, let me help you out. He said, your ambition is to be happy. Uh, and you do what you've got to do to make yourself happy. And so if following a course of action, you might be bright enough to go and do A-levels. You might not be very happy doing them. You might have been far happier spending yeah. your know, time earning, earning a few bob as it was in those days um, at the same time. So I, I, you know, I wouldn't advocate this one good route. What I would say is that, there, you know, um, you go as far as you can go, as far as you want to go. And apprenticeships are not, you know, it's not a blind alley. It is absolutely not a blind alley. It's just another, it's another route to higher education, if that's what you want to do. With all that's going on around COVID, the pandemic, the yeah. lockdown, you know, we don't know what, um, how long the economy will take to recover. Are you concerned about um, the effect, impact it will have on people's young careers that, you know, whether it, yeah. um, it blocks apprenticeship routes or indeed, you know, university issues and, you know. Yeah, yeah, I am. And, and I think thoughts on all that? Well, it, it, do, it worries me a lot. I mean, it's worrying lots of people, not just me. And um, I, I think the COVID is compounding a problem that was already starting you know, to emerge. And this, this is, you know, I, I'm blessed. And, you know, I was blessed, you know, with, with people looking after me. But I come from very large organizations um, where training and development was something that they just did. You know, ICI was a very paternalistic company. Uh, and if you start to look around now, large, you know, the BPs, the ICIs, the shells of this world are you know, re reducing in number and becoming increasingly international and less focused on apprenticeship. I'm not saying that, you know, that, that they don't care because they do, but becoming, it's not, it's not like it was in the 60s and the 50s and the 60s and the 70s. It just isn't. And what you've, re what you've now got are lots of SMEs. And, you know, whether an SME can be five people, 10 people, 50 people, you know, and that's great. And that's somebody working very hard to create jobs. But these companies don't have HR departments. They don't have training departments. You know, and if you, and if you only want one person a year, that's a, that's a big expense to be training one apprentice. And then if, then if the, you, you overlay that with, 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 with COVID, you know, and all of the issues that that brings, then the last thing you're thinking about, you know, it's about today. It's not about tomorrow or the day after. So you're right. So COVID just seems to, to compound the problem. Now, interestingly, one of the things that I've been thinking about a lot is if we have lots of people out of work, and we probably do in, 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 the, in, in the country, tens of thousands of you know, many thousands of people out of work there's six million uh, on furlough right now isn't there so well, you, well, you yeah, well, how well, many yeah, of those... uh, yeah exactly the point how many will how many will go back to what they're doing is a question but equally then if you think uh, the, the you know we're going to come i think we're going to talk about a little bit about you know sort of the the emerging economy in the tees valley and red car in particular you know hopefully we're going to get um you know the clean gas project you know, we've got, you know, the development of offshore wind. There are, there are a number of major developments that you would hope to see there, including, you know, sort of other, power, other energy sources as well. Well, they need construction workers. They need people to run them, to maintain them. And so the question then is, how do we, we've got, the, we've got a population that's going to be needed to be upskilled, to be reskilled, to be retrained. And then we've got this, this emerging need. It's a bit like having a, a kind of a you know a, a log jam on the M1. You know, suddenly it goes and everything everything wants to happen at the same time. Well, that that's going to be a problem for us. So I think we've got to start thinking ahead. To how do we put collective training programs together, where you're not really so where, and I've said this for many you know, people groaning listening to this. So oh, it's booth again, but getting SMEs to work together as a collective. So. You know, if I go back to my ICI days, you know, I worked in uh, services, I worked on the olefins business, the nylon business, the polyester business. They're all separate businesses. All it was ICI. So imagine a collective of SMEs, you know, who can offer training and development to young people. And we can get, get the right academic training as well. Or not to young people for that matter. People are, you suggesting, are you suggesting an apprentice could actually move between companies? 
yeah and that's why people and i i, I would advocate that because you know um I, i'm going to say it, it's not very popular um you know education set me free education should be free I, I, I'll, I'll say it to my dying day but it isn't right now if you want to go to university then you, you know you can go and take out a loan for i don't know 40 50 thousand pounds and you can do a degree anything you want to do because it's a free it's a free it's a free country the chance is if you do something which is very very obscure uh, of getting a job are slim at the moment but then you end up saddled with a debt and not much chance of doing what you want to do whereas with an apprenticeship you know currently you have to be employed you have to be paid think about it in in those terms so if i wanted to be a class one welder or a tiffy or an electrician um would i be prepared to take it's easy for me to see you know, well he would say that wouldn't he you know would, would i be prepared to take a small loan out so i could look after myself for the you know for the number of years it would take to become a qualified you know sought after technician whether you're electrical mechanical welding you know whatever whatever because i think that you will always be in employment and there's nothing stopping you by the way from going on as we just we said earlier on to doing you know um uh, more academic things if that's what you want to do but if there was a system in place whereby safely because i mean safely both in the hsd sense but also in the social sense we could move young people or and i'm so not so young people around various companies they could offer the modules you know in some administrative system uh, so that they could get that gold standard qualification then that solves the sme problem because we're creating a, a workforce for the future without without them having to sort of um uh, worry about employment rights and all that stuff that if you're employing 10 or 15 people you would be yeah and sounds, so, sounds like a common sense terrific idea paul and i think uh, well, yeah yeah <laughs> but but there are lots of reasons why people will tell you we haven't got time now maybe on another day but there yeah. are lots of reasons why people will tell you that's yeah you know, i'm standing in the corner by myself which is fine but i still believe what i've just said otherwise i wouldn't have said it yeah and, it, and it's important that you, we all speak out and not just only speak out on the things yeah. that we know we've got support for Paul, I'm aware that we could speak about apprenticeships yeah. all day because I know that you are yeah. passionate about it. Um, and another thing that I know that you've always been passionate about, because uh, I described you earlier as a, a champion of the chemical industry. I think yeah. you've always seen you, you know, you, you you have fought for the chemical industry. I think in probably every role that you, yeah. you, you've ever done, inside or outside of your actual employer. Um, and I know that there's certainly nobody more knowledgeable about the, the, the chemical industry than you are. So, and you've, you've long had this vision for its resurrection as well. So, so yep. Yep. amid, in the post Brexit, current COVID uh, crisis, I mean, how's that, how's that resurrection hope looking right now? Well, it, it just put, put sort of COVID to one side for a minute. I think, that the the industry has has been for uh, um, a, a number of years moving towards what I would call the green agenda, the sustainable agenda. You know, so the, the just bear with me, excuse me. Let me just get rid of that. Uh, so, so the the idea that we can move into uh, biochemicals, biofeedstocks, um, you, you know, offshore wind through electrolysis to develop hydrogen. Um, and therefore, you know, develop the hydrogen economy. Um, CO2, you know, that, that, that we've talked earlier, I mentioned earlier, you know, clean gas. If you've got hydrogen and CO2, then you, you've potentially got, you, you've got methane or methanol. You, you've got lots of other, CO2 can be actually used. You can, you can actually make urea from CO2 and ammonia. You know, there are lots and lots of ways in which you can combine um, chemicals in a, in a greener more sustainable way so it's about moving from where we are to you know it, it's remember these investments you know typically take seven eight nine years you know from from when you start so these things don't happen overnight but i i see generally the industry has been moving in that direction will continue to move in that direction 
And, and so it, it, the industry isn't particularly, I, I think, phased by you know, climate change or by um, uh, the, the green agenda, because actually sustainability and the green agenda and profitability and giving us all the products that we need, it's, it's one and the same thing. So I think in the Tees Valley is in a great place. Because it's interesting what you're saying, Paul, because I, I, I often hear that the chemical industry gets blamed almost for the, you know, when, when we start talking about the green issues. And yet in truth, yeah. it, it's got the solutions. It's going to be, it will be the solution if, if, if anyone can solve it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's interesting in COVID. I mean, you know, plastics, I, I understand the problems with plastics. I'm not going to deny that there are problems with, it's actually with the disposal of plastics. I think, I think it's pretty much where it is. But if you think about um, COVID and what you've seen on your TV every day is plastics, polymers, you know, screens, PPE, um, your food, you know, in terms of when it comes, when, if it's been delivered, you know, in, in, in uh, cling film, in plastic bags and whatever, whatever, whatever. P plastics and polymers are a part of, you know, modern living that allow us to eat what we want to eat and actually allow us to, um, to, 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 to look after ourselves in the medical sense as well. So we can't, you know, we can't do without them. What we have to do is make them in a different way from, you know, from bio sources and dispose of them more economically. You've heard me rabbit on, you know, we can actually chemically recycle, mechanically recycle polymers. And we should, we shouldn't be burning them at all. We should be you know, re reusing the molecules. And there are processes coming along and have been coming along for a decade where that's been possible. And I think the economics are changing as well. You know, landfill costs are becoming very expensive. So, you know, for instance, in, you know, mixed, mixed waste that we get, we, we all put in our bins, you know, the biomass, you know, the sandwiches and your, your dried bread and whatever else you, cardboard and paper you throw away is actually a biomass. And can you can, that, you, that is sustainable for energy. The, take the polymer out and recycle it. So you're actually creating jobs. Um, you are improving the environment and, you know, you're, you're helping, helping the economy to boot. So, and can, and can, can Teesside's um a chemical economy be be big part of that solution absolutely it needs to be it, it needs to be a big part of the uk economy uh in 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 what i would call the re you know the green agenda the re-emergence uh, of of the industry and the things that we take for granted like i said we need to think about how we make them in different ways you've got to go from somewhere to somewhere you can't just shut it down and say well, let's start again and do everything differently that transition just takes time it just does but I think there's a recognition that these technologies, the way of doing things, the, the way in which you know, society is demanding uh, that the industry moves is understood. And that's where it's going. You know, hence, you know, the, you know, the, the wonderful news of the, uh, you know, the net zero carbon project on, on Redcar, where we're going to build a power station and capture all the CO2. And then yeah. the Teesside Collective you know, will, will t tap into that, which, which hopefully makes the chemical industry that does still emit CO2 a whole lot greener up until the point when we have new technologies when CO2 is not emitted at all or it's used as a feedstock. It, uh, I've noticed that you, your first two things that we've discussed today, what you know, the apprenticeships and now the, the, the green agenda and they, both of them you've talked about collaboration between companies. It seems to be um, you know, a, a recurring theme in everything that we really need to do yeah. to solve our problems. Well, I think it's about, it's about, you know, whether it's SMEs, you know, it's about joining the dots. It's about working together. It's that point about work, you know, understanding that, you know, you can do stuff by yourself. That's fine. But working together and collaborating, you know, sharing knowledge, you know, how, how you build supply chains, how you do these things. It's a collaboration of industries, of government, of academia. These things all need to come together, whether you're training, developing people or whether you're building new projects. Um, it's about bringing organizations together that hitherto, you know, weren't working together. You know, it's so linking these industries in different ways. You know, one industry's waste is now the next industry's feedstock is, is actually the smart way to, to go. And it's about just sort of creating the understanding, but more importantly, the value proposition. 
because ultimately, whether I like it or not, there's got to be a value in what I'm, what, I'm going to make lots of proposals, but there's got to be a value in, 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 in doing that and job creation. Now, yes, job creation is value, but equally, if people are prepared to invest in that, there's got to be a return on the investment. You know, you'd be stupid to, to say that that wasn't a requirement. But the point is, I'm arguing and will argue and have argued for a long time, all this is possible and becoming yeah. more possible. Yeah, it just needs people to, to want to do it, I guess. Listen, uh, Paul, yeah. Paul, one of the things that I know that you've, so you, you, I, th I think it was 2016 now that you actually uh, uh, left SABIC after yeah. your long yeah. career that went sort of, it was, you, you didn't actually move. In 1800, some, some people tell me. It was 1870. <laughs> It was, uh, the, you were with ICI and then that bit, obviously Huntsman bought out the facility yep. and then Sabic bought out yep. those facilities, but yep. you stayed with the same company um, for all of those years. And then, and then just, just when I, I thought, no, there's no way Paul Booth would retire. And then of course you took up the, the role chairing the Tees Valley LEP and, yep. um, and you, you've, you've done that for the last few years. And, and, and um, I've got, now, now's the time to look back, I guess, and say, I know it was there to create growth and investment and jobs. So, so I've got to ask you, what's been the main successes um, of your time working with them? And what, what are your frustrations, shall we say, that, that, that still, you know, that, that keep you awake at night? Well, I, I, the, the frustrations are things don't happen quickly enough. You know, I think we'd all say that. You know, we all want something yesterday. Yeah, you know, I want the these big investments yesterday. I want people in jobs yesterday. One of my biggest frustrations has been in my time is sadly having to preside with others over the demise of SSI and the loss of you know we we were doing okay you know as a combined authority um, in creating SMEs we were doing we were punching above our weight then suddenly we have a body blow of was it eight thousand jobs we lost I mean in the in the whole supply chain and you know we we that was a frustration and a sadness for lots of people and and people will point out today and say yes well we recovered that and everybody who wanted to be back in employment is back in employment but, but guess what you know no disrespect to i don't know ice cream van drivers or whatever but you know being a skilled steel maker isn't quite, you know, from from being that to driving an ice cream van is not quite the same thing it's and no so yes people financially are in yeah, terms of the skills no. So, so there's so and and I think there's one of the reasons that I, I do what I do is to create these these new help to create these new businesses is to try and put right some of the wrong well wrongs is not the probably not the right word but some of the I guess the frustrations and the the sadness that we all felt when when that happened and there've been other there've been other blows besides that but that's been one of the biggest in recent times is I guess the biggest frustration and they say frustration because I think we were starting to, you know, make a difference. We were, you know, we were creating digital SMEs, and there were bio SMEs growing. We were starting to grow the economy. Things were getting better, and then, boom! You know, we had this this massive kind of shock, economic shock, um, which which sort of um, took it took us aback. But I think the successes are um, the the, LA, the the business community. Um, we, we we had something called Tees Value Unlimited. For 20 years before LEPs were ever invented, you know, so there'd been a history. To be fair to the the five local, you know, the unitary authorities, you know, we're, we're back in Sandy Anderson, you know, was 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 still there, of working together, and we'd all, you know, business has always worked together with the with the five um, boroughs, you know, on, on economic activity. The difference with the LEP was it moved into all of the other areas of social and tourism and you know transportation and everything else but the the spirit of cooperation still being there and i think what what you see today is one of the successes is the business leaders stand up and they say it like it is you know and 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 you know, from a point of knowledge uh and i think you know that's generally taken on board um in, in true consultative fashion so one of, we've got it, the point is the success is there's a great relationship there uh, between you know the elected leaders and the business leaders who come together in what is now the T you know the Tees Valley Combined Authority because mm -hmm. the LEP is now a part of that with 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 a shared budget, which makes things a lot easier actually. 
Um, so, and then the, 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 the other success is having business leaders uh, fully involved in the transportation agenda, in the education agenda, you know, in the tourism and leisure agendas, as well as economic recovery, because we have a, there are people with expertise in all of those areas, um, you know, that where, where we can help, you know, to develop policy uh, and, uh, you know, build the right frameworks for recovery. In fact, what the LEP right now is working on its economic response to COVID, along with the other, within the combined authority. And that's something that um, it will be a success. But then um, it's just sad that we, we had to, we've had to do what we've had to do. Yeah, it's not, it's not the 2020 that we planned so far. So. Uh, no, no, it isn't. Uh, but Paul, I'm going to, uh, right, again, uh, it's, it's, it's reflecting a bit ab about your career. And I, I know you've worked alongside some great business people, mm. great industrialists, great politicians, dare I say, yep. Um, yep. Um, over, the, over the many years. So, so I'm going to ask you, do a bit of name dropping here. Who, who, who's been the, the biggest influence? Who's made the biggest impact on, on you over, over the years? And, and, and tell, tell, us, tell us why. And, Give us, also give us a bit of reason to believe that you know we're being left in good hands too. Hmm. Um, I think in, in, in you know I, I I've been blessed. I mean, I, um, in ICI um, there were one of my very early mentors was a guy called Dennis Rickards, you know, brilliant um, senior manager, um, blessed with emotional intelligence. And um, he taught me, it wasn't about, you know, pi r squared equals 10 or fix that compressor. He taught me, he taught me different things. He taught me, you know, that again, it was building on the apprenticeship. It was about the value of understanding and valuing people. He taught me about, you know, humili <coughs> excuse me, humility. Um, he was the guy actually told me about um, my ambition. He said, my ambition was to be happy. Uh, and he said, you know, you do that. And I said, no, Dennis. And he said, oh, well, um, you've got to get the balance right, Paul. Time for yourself, time for work, time for your family. And you have to work hard at nothing else, work hard at that. And that will, that will bring you happiness. And you know what? I'm telling you six, nearly 60 years later that I can remember what he told me. And so he had a, you know, he had a big impression on me. Um, he had a big Jaguar as well at the time. <laughs> I, I was a petrol head. So he, he was probably you know, one of the very, very um, early influencers. Um, moving, and I've I worked for many great people, you know, Sandy Anderson I worked for and uh, Mike Gardner. I worked for some great guys in, in, in ICI. Um, but I think what, one of the, the, the standouts was John Huntsman, John Huntsman Sr. John Huntsman Jr. The Huntsman family were amazing people. This was of the of the uh, the American Huntsman Company, yeah. That, that yeah, obviously yeah. Bought, bought in bought in plants in uh, on Wilton some years ago. Well, Wilton. Well, they bought the the the, the dioxide business, the polyurethanes business, the olefins business, um, and they inherited offices, you know, pretty much all over Europe. But they were um, amazing people. Their value systems. Um, you 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 learned a lot from them about i've got a book up here it's called barefoot to billionaire and and, and winners don't cheat um john we, we went through some bad times in um uh 2002 and john huntsman incurred big debts and guess what he paid them all back but it, it, it was about um how how they treat people how they related to people how they valued people um, and you, you kind of thought of them as kind of this entrepreneurial, well, and they were true entrepreneurs, true entrepreneurs. But that didn't that didn't make them not care about people. It made them unique. Uh, and Peter, you know, was was in his father's mould as well. Still is probably. I, I haven't seen him for for many years. And there's a guy called Kevin Nino, who was a very close friend of Peter's, who I used to work for. And again, probably one of the smartest guys I've ever worked for ever in my whole life. He could, he would talk to presidents and he'd talk to, you know, people cleaning the streets in exactly the same way. And he could, he could switch levels instantaneously. It was amazing. Uh, and he used to say to me, Paul, 
uh, in God I trust. Everybody else can show me the data. And, and he, had, he, had, he, he had an amazing capacity, an amazing capacity to absorb information. And if you had an 80 point PowerPoint slide, you know, 80, 80 page PowerPoint slide, he would take you back to page two where you, there was some typo or something because he'd, he'd actually absorbed it. It was amazing. So he had a, he had a great, and, but Kevin, the reason I mentioned Kevin is, why Kevin, you know, you talk about fighting for T's side, you know, whether anybody believes it or not, Kevin and John Huntsman fought for the poly, for the polyethylene plant at Wilton. Remember, and they moved on while it was being built, but Kevin was the guy who basically fought through all of the red tape and all of the bureaucracy to make that a reality. And if the crack, if the, and I would argue, maybe incorrectly, if polyethylene wasn't there right now, neither would the cracker be. Yeah, so, you know, the, the crack is so important. I, I don't think people, too many people outside of the chemical industry realise just how important the cracker is yep. to um, our yep. economy. Yep. So although they, 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 they made an early exit, they left a legacy that maybe not too many people would give them a credit for. I do. I, I personally would because I know I lived through all that with them and I know what we did. Uh, and so the, the, um, the, there are people that I, I always admire, not just for their for their, their intellectual horsepower, but for their humanity as well. So, I mean, I know, I know you're not really standing down because you don't believe in that, do you? You know, uh, you may be off the payroll. No, but I have to put in the box when, when, I, when I go. <laughs> <laughs> Is that in the contract? The, uh, yeah. the, um, Paula, I mean, are you, are we, are we, are you, how are you feeling about letting go a little bit? And um, are is is the Tees Valley in good hands for you know the leaders yeah. that are in place? Well, you know what, everybody has a sell-by date. Um, nobody, you know, no, nobody is is irreplaceable. Anybody that if you start to think that, then you you start to, you, know, you you should worry. So I think you know sometimes it's good to refresh. It's good to replace. It's good to you know to give other people with fresh ideas and fresh views and uh, different ways of looking at things. That's that's the right. That's a that's that's a, that's healthy, you know, to, as part of the regeneration, and I think it's healthy to go and look for other things to do, you know. So um, I, I'm, you know, would I could I have done more? Would I have liked to have done more? I've already explained. I think it would be great if some of these things were spades in the ground and were really happening. Hopefully, one day they will. Before you know, I'm pushing the daisies up. Um, but yeah, I I I I think that uh, Tees Valley is in good hands. There are lots of great people on the LEP, really are. But we've got a, we've got a very uh, we've got a more balanced LEP, you know, from a from a skills base, from a you know from a diversity base as well. And there's more work to do there, but nevertheless, we've made some big improvements. So that's one of the successes, I think, from from where we started. You know, people like me, you know, sort of old grey and you know what's what's I can't what the word is. Um, anyway, so so that's that that's an improvement. But, more um, more women on the LEP now. Yes. Huh? Yeah. 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 Again, yeah. Something that yeah. I know you fought for. Yep. Yeah. Uh, certainly. You know that the. the um, I used to argue. I mean, back in the day, you know, I argued that we should be getting far more female apprentices, but that was, that was very difficult. Um, uh, and it, it's it's interesting. I'll I'll tell you it's it's, well, kind of a Weight Watchers story, but it happens to be true. So. Um, I, when I was traveling, I put a lot of weight on, um, still got a lot of weight on. And um, so I went to Weight Watchers. And what was interesting is you sit in a room, uh, on a, I was on a Monday night with probably 20, 30 ladies. And you can be completely ignored. Or if they choose to make a lot of fun of you because you're the only guy there. Yeah. And that, that's interesting because then you think, well, what must it be like to be a woman in a man's world for 40 hours a week? You know where there's not much in common so you then i i developed what i call my critical mass theory in other words if if you had four female apprentices you don't put one there one and somewhere else and one over there and one somewhere else but you really put them together and that that's i don't i don't want that to sound patronizing but it's to do with so it's to do with changing how we work socially it's you know it's having people when you come in from your tea break having something in common with people you know, so you enjoy work back to being happy and not feeling isolated. Uh, and, and so 
it, to get over the critical mass is is difficult. So that's why I think it's some industries already there because it's obvious and it's natural and you think, well, that, that's how they work. But where, where you've got male dominated industries, I still think that's a challenge because a lot of the jobs, you know, women are perfectly capable of doing. You know, there's no question at all in my mind. You know, I'm not talking about engineering jobs. I'm talking about, te you know, technician jobs. And they're and the, and the well-paid jobs. They really are well-paid jobs. So that's something that I've, I've, I've tried very hard, not very successfully to change. That moving that dial is, has been very difficult, if it's moved at all. In some industries it has, in others it hasn't. Yeah, the challenges very much remain. I'm going to ask you one last question, Paul, because I know you have to go. It's been quite a journey for you, of course. So for those with aspirations to go on a whether it be not a similar journey, but their own journey, you know, that, uh, you know, in what, 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 what tips for leadership, uh, whether it be in biz, business or industry or what, whatever field they're in, what tip, what tips for leadership would you, would you be, uh, would you pass on? Um, well, I, th I think first of all, you, you, you're only, you're only ever as good as the people you've got around you. And so I think in a leadership role, it's important that you, 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 you get the right people um, with the right blend of skills and experience and knowledge uh, and teamwork and ability to work in teams around you. Um, I used to tell you, I said, you're here to make me look good. I was joking, of course. No, I wasn't. But, you know, I, I think it, it's, about, it's about making sure that you can build the team. Because actually, if it all go, if it all falls apart when you walk away, then you, you know you're not a very good leader. Because it should it should work. You should be able to get, you know spin the plate and walk away and leave it, and the team is performing. Um, so it's about building good teams and and building and 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 for training and developing good people, you know as well. Um, I think leadership's also a lot about humility um, and being willing to listen and to learn from others. Um, uh, and I think you know God gave us two ears and one mouth, so you listen twice as hard as you speak. Uh, and I think that that's that's important as well. And other let other people have ideas, set other people free, um, let, give them you know it's uh, it's it used to, the, the buzzword in the night was empowerment, you know, but but empower people you know to. To, to 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 do what they can do, you know, to, to maximise their their, um, uh, their 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 contribution. I think a, a good leadership um, uh, traits. Those are things that um, I, I think are very important. You know, there's all the all the normal stuff like you know, you can strategic thinking and all that. But really, when it comes down to it, it's it's about how you motivate, how you inspire, how you um, uh, can can get people, you know, to, to to do things that they never thought they could do, are the hallmarks of good leaders. I'm not saying I'm one, by the way. I'm just saying that's what I practice. Well, 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 I'll say that for everybody else. We know we know that you've been a great leader, Paul. And um, and I, I think the one thing that you missed out there that you'd already mentioned several times during this meeting is that make sure that you're happy in whatever you're doing. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. yeah. I, I, no, it, the, um, that's the ambition. I think anybody's ambition. You know, is to think if think about it. You know, do I want to be a, a millionaire or what? No, because there are lots of unhappy millionaires around. I think it is truly, you know, to go through life and to do the things that make you happy. And I said back to that other word, balance. You know, there's, you got to get the balance in life right. And then if you can get that right and you can be happy, then and you can stay healthy, then you're blessed. All oh, fantastic. Really could could listen to you all day talking about about um, your insight. That's all we have time for, unfortunately, this week on Talking Business um, in association with um, Cornerstone Business Solutions, the Stockton-based IT specialists. Thank you to Paul for joining us and providing such a, a fascinating insight, Paul, into your career and the, the challenges and opportunities mm -hmm. for Tees Valley's businesses and industries. Thanks again to, to Chris Petty and Cornerstone for their sponsorship. We'll be back next week for more Talking Business. Join us again then. In the meantime, from myself, Dave Allen, and my business partner, Martin Walker, and all at Tease Business, uh, stay safe, stay positive, and keep talking up business across the Tease region. Thank you.